Joining me today are three of the baddest women in the game who are here to discuss uh, the question that I'm sure is on everyone's lips, which is what the fuck is the women's strike? So the women's strike is going to be taking place on Thursday, so the 8th of March on International Women's Day. And on the day, women in more than 50 countries across the world are going to be withdrawing their paid and unpaid labour. So that means going on strike from all that emotional and domestic work that keeps this world going in some kind of livable form. And it also means going on strike from our offices, our factories, our schools, hospitals and strip clubs, etc. So joining me today to talk about what the political significance of a women's strike is in 2018, we have Camille Barbagallo, who is an organiser at the Women's Strike Assembly, Women's Strike Assembly and a mum of two. We have Sam Siever, who is an organiser at the Women's Strike Assembly and Plan C London. And we have Nadine Houghton, who is a union organiser, labour organiser and also a mum of two. So, to start us off, um, obviously the idea of a women's strike isn't new. It's been like a really integral tactic of the women's movement for a really long time. Could you tell me a little bit about the history of um, the, like women's strikes as a tactic of feminist organising? and why it's still important in 2018 for us to be taking this kind of action. Yeah, certainly. Like, the history of the strike is really the history of the women, the women's strike. Uh, from women in Manhattan in 1908, uh, which inaugurated International Women's Day, to actually the women who started the Russian Revolution, uh, demanding bread and roses and peace, uh, to our own history here in the UK with the Dagenham strike, uh, which saw uh, the Equal Pay Act getting brought in in 1970. Um, and so really, the women's strike isn't, an, isn't anything new, uh, though it's certainly made a comeback uh, in the last couple of years. Uh, people might remember in 2016, uh, Polish women, uh, hundreds of thousands of Polish women came out on the streets uh, against the criminalisation of abortion. Uh, and that really um, ignited uh, the tactic again. Uh, and it's certainly travelled around the world since then. Uh, last year, uh, in 2017, we saw uh, the first international women's strike being coordinated in over 54 countries. Wow. Yeah, so, and I think like what's really important about the tactic of the strike and the significance of a women's strike is the idea that a strike is a tool and it's something that we can use to bring about radical change. And like Camille said, it's nothing new, but maybe in some way we've kind of lost touch with it. And it's sort of like, you know, you can hear like a lot of trade union leaders sometimes almost apologizing for strikes. You know, they'll, they'll kind of say like, you know, oh, it, was, it, was our, it was the only sort of thing that we had left. It was, you know, we were forced into it. And like, I often think about a strike as like, actually it's the most powerful thing that a group of working people can do is to withdraw their labor that's the most powerful tool that they have whether that's against the bosses or against the patriarchy or whatever it might be and women have been showing us how to do that and have been doing that effectively throughout history and like we forget that the trade union movement in this country was born out of women striking young working class women in the east end of london irish and possibly Jewish migrants, don't quote me on that, working in a factory in the East End of London, going on strike um, against their working conditions, pay and everything else. And it was that strike, the match women strike, that led to the dockers taking mass strike action that led to the birth of the trade union movement as we know it today in this country. And Camille's referred to um, the birth of the Equal Pay Act coming about as a result of the Grunwick strike, uh, sorry, as the, of the Ford Dagenham strike. You know, these women were kind of written off as insignificant. Even the trade union leaders didn't want to know about their struggles and their disputes. And it wasn't until they took matters into their own hands and withdrew their labours, they brought that factory to a standstill. So it's kind of, and, and, and we've, you know, we saw it with Jai Ben Desai and the Grunwick strike. Um, and, and, and we're seeing it a, a kind of resurgence of that now with the struggles against outsourcing, um, teaching assistance, um, you know, the, the issue of equal pay is, is kind of on the, on the agenda now. Um, and so I think what's really significant about the women's strike and about looking at the history of strikes that have been led by women is that they've changed, they've changed the world, you know, for women. And we want to get back to that place and we want to reclaim that and we want to start using the strike as a tool to bring about that change. I think also that the women's strike is a devastatingly simple concept. Mm. Like people go on strike when their conditions of life and labour are shit. 
basically. Yeah. Uh, and for women, uh, both here in the UK and across the world, uh, we have childcare costs that are some of the highest in the EU, which makes working a mugs game because you're basically working just to pay so someone else can look after your kids. Mm. Uh, the levels of sexual harassment uh, that we, women experience in the workplace. Um, and the fact that basically the cost of living in the UK has gone through the roof. People's food bills have uh, doubled. We, we, pe women are paid such a low amount in so many different industries that paying the rent is really difficult. Like at a certain point, what other answer is there other than to strike? Mm. Yeah, and like one thing that that makes me think about is um, I remember when we were in the May Day rooms and we were looking at the posters like from decades mm. ago of women's strikes and how like the demands were remarkably similar. Mm. And I wonder if like that's kind of the fact that we're still in that place is it is kind of testament to the decline of strikes as a mm. strategy that people think of, particularly when it comes to like the conditions of a gender, you know, like, do you think like, do you think that that could be kind of particularly looking at how feminism has developed over the past decade? Like, it's interesting that at this moment mm. strike has come back as like kind of a strategy that's on the table. Yeah. And, and you know, our feminism has to be rooted in the struggles of working class women mm. and intersectionality. And, you know, I think from my experience of organising women uh, workers, low paid women workers, you know, they're predominantly cleaners or hostesses, you know, they're carrying out the sort of work that is an extension of the unpaid work that they do in the home. Mm. So, you know, they know that, they, they see that, you know, because they, cause they're living it on a day to day basis. So, what is the point of just having these struggles in the workplace against low pay, um, you know, against cuts to sick pay or cuts to maternity pay or whatever it might be, if we're not also having that struggle in the home? Because the whole time that work that we do in the home goes undervalued, unpaid, uh, it, it, it will just, it's just a continuum that that will happen in the workplace as well. So the whole time we're not paid for the cleaning and the caring we do in the home, it's always going to be low paid and undervalued outside of it as well. Yeah, and it's really interesting that you bring that up because one thing I've kind of noticed speaking to even like other people on the left is a lot of people find it really hard to wrap their head. You know, there's this kind of idea of strikes as being something that happens mm. from, you know, like an institutional institutionalised union. It happens in a particular kind of workplace in response to a particular kind of work that's like in the public sphere is waged. It makes sense in like a factory or an office or something like that. But a lot of people can't get their head around the idea that you can strike, firstly, as a kind of social class and that you can strike from a home or from sex or from, you know, caring. Um, so why is it like really important that we can like think about women's labour in this term, in these terms? And what does it say about how we think of strikes now, um, given, you know, the fact that they don't tend to encompass these forms of labour? Mm. Well... I think that in terms of like the women's strike is not a traditional industrial strike, but as we've seen in the UK, lots of uh, women and some men are actually going on strike on March the 8th as well from their waged work. Uh, and so I think the, the, the take home message around the women's strike is that it, it, and it's been conceived of this way by lots of different women around the world, is as a political strike which returns the strike to uh, some of its older history as well. And it doesn't confine us just to the workplace. Uh, and that's got to do with the fact that women's work uh, is both waged and unwaged. Uh, and it's really the work, it's all the cooking, the cleaning and the caring that kind of makes the world go round uh, and makes life possible. But what we know about that work is that despite a uh, hundred and odd years of feminist agitation and demands, that work remains devalued, it remains really invisible. Uh, and so I think one of the easy ways for people, uh, I think what's really interesting actually is that the vast majority of people I've spoken to outside of the left, mm. uh, this is not really a question for them. Uh, because actually, as I said before, it's actually a really simple and easy concept to grasp uh, when your conditions of life and labour uh, are, have deteriorated so much. I think then that's a question of why is it so difficult for people in the left to get their heads around and what are they hanging on to uh, by kind of denying the fact of its legitimacy and also its urgency and why it's come uh, to the fore now. Uh, and that's really a question for them to answer and not us. <laughs> um, but in terms of, uh, like, I think that if we, if we think about the women's strike, uh, one way to think about it is about taking 
all of those private conversations, those private disagreements and those arguments that we have with our partners and with our husbands around who it is that needs to do the washing up, who needs to pick up the mm. kids, uh, that really wear you down and that really form a basis of our domestic life. And it's about taking all of those disagreements and about bringing them into the public and about making them a public form of action. Mm -hmm. uh, and I really think that for lots of people, that's a really transformative process. So it's the women's strike for me, and I think for a lot of women around the world, isn't about what necessarily happens on March the 8th. It's about the process and the kinds of conversations that women are having with each other and also that we're having with our partners, uh, what, it, what it means to actually leave the house that day and say, you know what, I'm on strike and you're going to have to deal with that. Um, I think is part of the process of reimagining what politics can be mm. uh, and also reimagining how women's demands need to be central to any kind of vision that we're moving towards in the future. And I think, like, for me, I, just from my own personal experience around, like, oh, were you trying to get in there? No, 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 oh, my like, God, I'm so... So, no, no, go on, go on, go on. Oh, I go was on. just going to say, like, Camille wrote an article that was for the website and it was about, like, why this strike is impossible strike or mm. and how it will like most strikes industrial strikes there's like a set of demands and then there's a whole negotiation with like the powers that be and then the workers and it's a struggle but with the women's strike it's broader than that it's not it doesn't have like a set of demands that can be like easily solved and i think that's really beautiful because like demands mean when you have demands they have to be compromised you have to be like waiting on um, like a top-down system to grant them, right? Mm -hmm. And you're asking, well, the women's strike is about nurturing resistance and like the a political power in people who have not been able to, I guess, bring their issues to a public space, to a public arena. And I think that's really important as well. Right? Yeah. I'm really sorry. No, it's okay. Cool. <laughs> I was just enjoying listening to everyone. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so for me, like the the reason this, that this resonated with me. Um, it's not so much kind of because I'm a union organiser or because of my you know, politics as a socialist or someone that's on the left. It's because I'm a mum and I only really knew that I was a feminist when I had children, after I had babies, because the kind of many different layers of oppression really that you experience once you've had babies, you know, just the struggle in your own home, you know, in the kitchen or the bedroom or wherever it is to kind of have, uh, you know, equality and an equal sharing of that sort of domestic and reproductive labour, just having to have those continuous arguments over and over again. And, you know, it's that kind of feeling that you're like a nagging woman. Do you know what I mean? That's how women sort of often get portrayed. And it's it's not like there's so much organising. It's, you know, motherhood and the work that I do at home. These are skills that I've had to learn. I don't just inherently have these skills because I'm a woman. These are, you know, characteristics and skills that I've had to learn. And sometimes these lessons have been really hard to learn. And it's like we're socialised into those roles and men are socialised in a completely different way to carry out other roles. And, you know, part of the you know it, women that are in that that situation totally get that because they're living it on a day-to-day -day basis so like Camille said that the concept for, for, for women experiencing those things it's not a difficult concept to grasp you know perhaps for people that aren't necessarily in that situation it might seem a bit obscure but it's not you know yeah that makes me think of uh there one of the women that used to like babysit me loads as a kid she's like super like she's like quite um, she's like very like you kippy like quite we disagree on everything but the one thing we agree on is wages for housework she's mm. a mum of five and it is that thing of that like it's only within these really esoteric circles that I think like it, it kind of doesn't make as much it it sort of seems to be such a difficult thing for people to get their heads around and also like one of the like biggest like something that feminism like contributed to you know so contributed to political conversations was this idea that like what happens in the private like there is no private and public sphere there is no like hard and fast division and it's that idea that like you're having all of these arguments with your partner it's not because you're with a uniquely mm. shit dude or like a uni or you have a uniquely shit dad it's because like that's a political setup that kind of situates you both mm. in that position mm. um but obviously like and we were talking a bit earlier about sort of the different iterations of like the feminist movement and I was wondering how you see this as fitting into other kind of 
parts of the women's movement that are happening now. So things like Me Too, things like the Women's March, you know, do you see this as kind of part of that or bringing something to it? Or how do you see the relationship between those kind of parts of the movement? I think that what we're witnessing uh, in places like in South America, places like North America, and also here in the UK in a variety of different ways, is a, a real rupture around how the gendered contract is kind of being negotiated. And I think with Me Too, uh, there's a similarity between the women's strike, what we were talking about before, about taking all of those individual experiences and conflicts and arguments around women's work and about making them public. Me Too was a kind of similar thing. It was about linking up and starting to see the kind of connections that exist uh, around questions around sexual harassment in the, in the workplace, that you're not alone, that, uh, that actually millions of women around the world responded to that uh, moment uh, and outpouring. And really the flood is relentless at this point. Uh, we've toppled a whole variety of previously uh, really important uh, figures out of uh, the entertainment business and it, it shows no sign of abating it in any way. And it's really taken different forms around the world um, in terms of places like Finland, uh, we had 90% of women in some industries signing open petitions, uh, talking about the Me Too uh, phenomena in their industry. Um, I think, though, the question is, is uh, d despite uh, you know, a desire maybe for it, hashtags and memes aren't going to save us, and they're certainly not going to dismantle uh, systemic violence and exploitation. So the women's strike is a question around what kinds of political power and what kinds of collective action do we need to take to change the very system that produces women as inferior and secondary in the first place. Uh, and also shines a light on saying that uh, obviously sexual harassment isn't just something that happens in Hollywood. Sexual harassment and gendered violence uh, is endemic across all industries. Uh, and it's really at the heart of women's labour exploitation. Uh, and that's, I think, the conversation of adding the question around labour and work and strikes and all of the kind of conversations that come up when you start talking about a strike to this current moment around Me Too. Yeah, and I think what the Me Too movement was so interesting in highlighting was a lot of the kind of things that put women in, you know, that low wage labour and, and, you know, like in the domestic sphere, all of the things that are, are taken as reasons why women are naturally good at particular kinds of labour, the very things, the very places where that's weaponised against them mm -hmm. in the form of violence. Did anyone else have anything to kind of respond to that question about like the relationship to the Me Too movement and the Women's March? Well, like, I think um, with a lot of like women's uh, feminism at the moment is quite internet based and that's the same mm. thing you can see with like a lot of like l the left and what I think was really great about the women's strike is that it's all the things that we have on social media is to get people together in a space in a public space to make it an IRL interaction mm. with like <laughs> politics and I think that's essential now because everyone gets caught up with social media and hashtags as if like you were saying, hashtags won't change, um, like bring about liberation or like change anything. And um, I, I don't know that much about the Women's March, so I can't say anything about And I think it's really powerful that people could share their experiences with Me Too, but I feel that we need more concrete ways of politicizing other than just like the performative participation of social media mm. we need to actually participate with each other by looking at each other and seeing how we can energize and support each other flash to flash face to face you know? mm. I also think it's about unionization yeah. like in terms of like where we see um, instances of women being able to fight back about violence in the workplace is when they have a union and also I think then that what the women's strike starts to do is link up both experiences of violence outside of the workplace with experiences of violence in the workplace as well. Mm -hmm. And so it's not enough just to have a union at work. Actually, we need to be using our labour power and the strength that we have as workers to start affecting other spheres of life, whether that be uh, demanding ecological justice uh, and using our labour power to ensure that we're not uh, continuing to fuck the earth and bring about the apocalypse in a really uh, short period of time, or whether or not women start to use our industrial strength to create the changes that we need outside of the wage labour market. Yeah, and I think it's like with Me Too, it's become so much about getting people fired when mm -hmm. like what I found with the Women's Strike um, Assembly is that I've made connections and found support networks with women who are also wanting to 
unionize to work together towards this um, event or this movement and creating a movement past just the strike as well mm. it's like creating support networks through that yeah, yeah no I, d I think that the the women's strike and the me too movement need to become intertwined so for example like i was reading about the experiences of american female hospitality workers and particularly waitresses that rely on tips to top up their their wage you know their really low wages and they have to behave in a certain way towards their customers if they're going to get those tips. And that involves allowing men to touch them, you know, having to kind of stroke men's egos, you know, behaving in a certain way that, you know, apparently women, you know, should behave in um, in order to get those tips. And it's, and it's back to that point that you made. It's about unionisation. It's about having the industrial and collective strength to challenge the structures that force women into that position in the first place. Mm. And that's obviously particularly an issue for migrant women as well. And particularly, you know, if you're an undocumented worker, how can you possibly challenge, you know, if your boss is, is exploiting you and he's demanding other things off of you as well, so you keep your job, how do you challenge that if you are in a particularly vulnerable position? And again, you know, and it's back to having strong workplace organising and women leading that workplace organising. And I don't think it's just around traditional uh, recognised unions. Like what we've yeah. seen across the board uh, mm. in London is grassroots militant unions organising migrant workers, some of them with a irregular immigration status, overwhelmingly in the service sector. Mm -hmm. And what's the one thing that's getting the goods in terms of bringing about the London living wage? It's the tactic of a strike. Mm -hmm. It's the ability, the confidence, and actually going out and doing it. Not just threatening it and not just apologizing for doing it, but actually going out on strike. And we're seeing uh, previously unheard of or unimaginable kind of gains where uh, outsourced workers are being brought back in house, uh, back into the kinds of conditions that uh, some of the people who are higher up the food chain have taken for granted for a long time. Things like maternity pay, sick pay, holiday pay. Um, and so I think that actually migrant women uh, in grassroots unions have really sh are actually leading the working class mm. in the United Kingdom at the moment. Uh, and. Uh, and it's a wake-up call to trade unions, uh, to both organise those people, to be combative, uh, and also to, I think the women's strike is about challenging the fact that industrial struggle doesn't end at the employment contract. Mm. Like, that's something, that's a, that's a loss. We've lost that in terms of, like, our, we, we are the workers of the world, we make the world, and our, and our lives extend past uh, our employment contracts and I think we've got to start to think about using the leverage that we have in the workplace to start demanding the kinds of change that we want to see across the board. Yeah and like so much of that relies on like an internalization of like you have no political power, you have no political voice, especially if you're undocumented. Um, this idea of like we have complete control over you and it's about kind of like recognizing that through your labor power you actually have the power to shut this shit down mm. essentially. Um, but on the topic as well of like particularly kind of migrant women in this country um, sort of leading the left in, in, in kind of becoming much more militant and doing the kinds of actions that gets the goods, um, as I'm sure um, you all know and a lot of you guys at home will know, um, there are currently women in, in Yarls Wood, which is an all-women's detention centre in Bedfordshire, that have been on hunger strike for several days now, and they are protesting the inhuman conditions that they are facing in indefinite detention. Um, so in what a lot of the detainees have referred to as a prison, essentially, um, women have been experiencing sexual violence, they've been experiencing really underpaid, like, low-wage labour, uh, and they've also been experiencing the denial of healthcare, particularly... Um, specialised healthcare for pregnant and trans women. And this has been um, amounted to what one detainee has called systemic torture. And this is all in addition, obviously, to the fact of indefinite detention and all detention, which is a form of violence in itself and one that the British Medical Association has actually said needs to be phased out um, because of its impact on the health of detainees. So um, obviously, like, this is really relevant because it's a form of strike and it's being led by women. Um, but could you tell me a bit about the role that, you know, like borders, detention centres and like immigration policy as a whole plays in creating the conditions for this kind of structural as well as interpersonal violences that women face in all of their workplaces? So I 
with the solidarity with the Yarlswood hunger strikers for first, mm -hmm. like firstly, I think we need to be paying attention to what they're doing, and it's really ridiculous the conditions that they're living in and how Britain can like delude itself into thinking, oh yeah, we're such a progressive and liberal society or whatever. Like, um, yeah, it's fucked up. And I was trying to stop myself from saying that. And I remembered, yeah, cause, sorry, um, yeah. And like, um, I was just like updating myself on it. And then hunger strikers have had to like sign documents where like they're they're um, it'll waive the liability of Sarco and the Home Office if they die, for example. And also like their medication is being denied because they're striking. And um, some hunger strikers have even been deported. And it's all like how. Being a migrant within the UK, it you have to police yourself in like w whether you're in your like um, interaction in the workplace with law with justice system, and that you have this black mark on you whether it's with your skin color or just like your nationality, where you're constantly feeling under threat that you cannot speak out, you cannot say anything, you cannot make any demands to be treated fairly migrant women or migrant impairing women because they're dehumanized within mainstream media they can be violated or um whether it's like through micro microaggressions or like their hijab being like pulled off or just people shouting things at them people making them feel unwelcome discrimination from like housing or getting starting jobs and these are all structural as well as like physical ways that you can experience violence because of your status, your citizenship status, and even if you are a citizen but you just look or sound as if you're not, that instantly means that you face like forms of police brutality, stop and search, or like just through, I guess, like internalized racism that pe like your bosses might have towards you mm -hmm. because they expect you to behave in a certain way you're supposed to be a lot more like subordinate you're supposed to like, assume this subordinate role and yeah it's the same point. yeah and I, I also think it's about thinking about how we take the strategy of the women's strike to start to uh, think through some other areas that we want to change like for instance how do we get rid of prevent um, out of the education system? How do we get out of it? How do we get rid of it out of high schools and out of universities? Well, in primary and high, and high school, who are, the, who are the workers in that industry? Those in, that, that industry is overwhelmingly a female industry. Um, and certainly across the US at the moment, uh, we're starting to see women teachers really waking up. I don't know mm -hmm. if anyone else has been following West Virginia, mm -hmm. but there's currently a wildcat strike going on there where women are refusing to go back to work until they get not only a pay deal for themselves, but for all state mm -hmm. um, employees. And so I think that what we're starting to see is this question around, like, it's not just around wages and conditions, is it? It's around what does your job do? And if your job is about racially profiling um, students in your classroom, then we need to start to think about politicising those questions uh, and re reconnecting them back to the question of how do we take action against them, uh, uh, against those kinds of uh, sexist or racist manifestations. And I think the strike, it's not the answer, but it opens up a series of questions and a series of conversations that innate, and it gives us a tactic mm. to think through um, some of those things. And I think, especially in questions around reproductive labour, like lots of people have said to, to us, but midwives can't strike, but nurses can't strike. And sure, um, a, a skeletal staff need to stay in place uh, because no one wants the women's strike to, in, to mean that people end up getting um, ha harmed or that they can't have their babies with the kind of support and care that they need to have. But what does, uh, how, do we, what, how do we confront the absolute crisis that the NHS is in? Uh, do we tell women that, we, do we take away the one industrial strategy that women need to be able to save the NHS? And how do we start to think about who's accessing the NHS? So what does uh, patient and, and worker action taken together start to do? And, and I think that's what the strike for me is, like it, it doesn't just position you as a worker or as a mother, but allows you to transverse across different identities and start to think about workplaces in a way that... Uh, can actually bring about the kind of change that we need to basically get rid of the Tories, uh, to stop austerity, and also to confront the social crisis that's currently unfolding across the United Kingdom.
Yeah, it's about building power, essentially. Um, yeah, so those of you who want to show solidarity with the Yarswood hunger strike, there's actually a solidarity fast that is taking place on International Women's Day. Um, and you can go to freedomfastyarswood.com to find out more. Um, we're going on a short break now, but stay tuned because we will be joined by Molly Gerlach Arthurs from the Sex Worker Advocacy and Resistance Movement, who will be talking to us about the sex work strike. Stay tuned. <laughs> locality the blue fences lined up one after another what is it trying to hide black tinted van comes silently drops a scared prisoner secretly what is coming next within a second life has been totally changed anxious heart confused head and tired body. Will I be rescued without crime to become a criminal is not easy to accept. The handcuff hands become a nightmare. Is it a crime to seek protection without knowing the time scale of the imprisonment? Anyone can be locked up there forever. What is my crime? The most civilized society in the world, the most supremely power country of the earth. Why do you need to build a concentrant camp like that? Why do you treat us as criminal? Do we look like non-human? I was detained four years ago. It was a very bad experience. I was there for about two, three weeks and I was taken to the airport to get deported back into Swaziland and that was so distressing. So people were fighting my case and fighting for me not to get deported, which I really appreciate. And that's why I'm here today, to show the support that I got when I was in there. Uh, no, I didn't get as far as getting to the plane, but I got to, to the part whereby I was sitting in a room in the airport whilst they were preparing to take me back. And um, I was just sitting there very hopeful that I wouldn't go back because of all the support that I knew I was getting from the media even and from other people that I don't know, which was very helpful for me. I am a refugee. My claim was uh, successful, which I'm very grateful for. Well, it wasn't clear what was happening at that time. So, um, but they brought me back to the detention after the deportation failed. And I think I stayed here for a few days before I was released. I think Yarlswood needs to be shut down because anyone who's in there is not a criminal and has not created any offence. They're just human beings just like everyone else and they deserve to be treated like human beings. Hello everyone, welcome back to The Fix. In this part of the show, we're gonna be discussing what the fuck is the sex worker strike? So joining me for this part, we've got Camille Barbagallo again and we've also got Molly Gerlach Arthurs. Um, so let's get right into it. Molly, could you tell me a little bit about um, the plans for the 8th of March sex work strike and what your kind of core central demands are? OK, so um, the reason we're having the strike is that there's a huge need to recognise that sex workers are a huge and valid labour force, especially in the UK. Um, and it's absolutely impossible to improve conditions in a labour force when huge parts of it are criminalised. Um, and sex workers are already collecting. We've got Swarm in the UK, um, Sex Worker Advocacy and Resistance Movement. We've got the English Collective of Prostitutes. We've got East London Strippers Collective. Um, but it's really hard for sex workers' voices to be heard when they can't really disclose their status. Um, and what sex worker groups are saying is that rescue missions are not working. Shutting down venues is not working. What is needed is decriminalisation. What is needed is rights for workers. Um, so what we're doing on the 8th of March is we are gathering at 7pm, Dean Street in Soho, um, and we're going to march through Soho, wearing red, making lots of noise and just demanding decriminalisation for all sex workers in the UK. 
Mm. Yeah, and, and there's a, obviously like a really long history of um, particularly kind of middle class, particularly white feminist movements of like not only pushing sex workers out of the movement, but actually actively advocating for policies that harm sex workers, ironically, in the name of protecting women um, or protecting women's rights. So could you tell me a bit about, you know, why it's really important that this women's strike doesn't just kind of like passively include sex workers, but actually centralises sex worker rights as core to its political like objectives? I think really inclusivity politics is like the beige of radical uh, politics uh, in that we don't actually, I'm not interested in trying to build a feminist movement that tries to include a whole variety of people that have been excluded, especially when there hasn't really been a reckoning about uh, some of the politics uh, that kind of makes sex icky, uh, where um, people selling sex are somehow whores and deviants and need to be rehabilitated. Like all of these questions need to be uh, kind of brought to the fore and we need to have the argument out. Uh, in the meantime, decriminalisation of sex work is really a demand uh, whose time has come, uh, in my eyes. Uh, what we've seen around the world for decades and centuries is that criminalisation not only doesn't work, but it makes the industry unsafe. Uh, and it's the when you've got collusion with police, when you've got corruption, and also when you empower bosses to treat workers however they want. Uh, so if you want to uh, change the sex industry, the only way to do that is to give power to workers. Uh, and the only way that workers can organise at work, like we don't just want legal, ref legal change. Uh, the law amazingly won't save us. Uh, but people coming together in their workplaces uh, to start to change the sex industry can only happen under conditions of decriminalisation. I think the, the feminism that excludes sex workers from the narrative is very much the feminism of respectability and respectability politics. Um, it's feminists who want to be seen in a certain way, in a very sterile way. Um, it's feminists who want to be able to succeed in business. Um, and really what sex worker movements in the UK are saying is, you know, fuck your respectability politics. It doesn't matter about being respected or seen in a certain way. This is a welfare issue. Decriminalisation is life or death. Um, and honestly, who could give a shit how men see sex workers? Sex workers just need safety. Yeah, and it's, it's so contradictory, isn't it? Because it's like, as long as you kind of reinforce and leave intact that kind of like, Madonna whore binary, you're leaving intact like the greatest weapon that's used against you. So, and it's like the answer isn't saving or any of that bullshit, it's like solidarity. And that seems to be just something that like, it's a particular kind of like, you know, middle class and also like white feminist, I think, like position. But um, like another thing that I've kind of found really interesting, particularly, and something that I think isn't highlighted that much is like, the relationship that Theresa May has with sex work is actually not highlighted very much. But um, during her stint as like Home Secretary, um, one of her big things, and now, one of her big things is like anti-trafficking, um, anti-slavery kind of work. And this has often been used as a veil to basically crack down on sex workers and to also like really bolster borders. So one example was there was a huge like crackdown on sex work, um, which involved like high policing of areas where sex workers work. Um, and like just after I think it was the Olympics, even though there was no reason to like, there was no evidence that there was any kind of rise in actual trafficking. Um, but this kind of all seems to like, there seems to be a really intimate connection between like, vi like migrant controls and like the oppression of sex workers. So I was wondering like, Firstly, you know, if you could talk to me about, you know, the relationship between migrant rights and sex worker rights and how the sex work strike is kind of negotiating ha this idea that you can't talk about migrants' rights without talking about sex worker rights and you can't talk about sex worker rights without talking about migrant worker rights, essentially. Yeah, I think that what we've seen in the UK, especially over the last 10 years, is this ramping up of the idea that all migrants in the sex industry are trafficked basically, which is a pretty racist concept, really. Uh, and it's racist to the, to the extent that it strips migrant women of any agency 
Uh, and it also kind of denies the fact that lots of uh, women sell sex in a whole variety of different industries, not just in the sex industry, uh, but that we sell and trade and use sex in a whole variety of different ways. So I think it makes invisible, first of all, the kind of sexual currency uh, that women use and trade and are expected to use in other industries. Uh, and it also uh, completely um, makes in like makes migrant sex workers uh, into these kind of like like the proper good victims mm. basically who are just waiting for white men uh, usually in police uniforms to beat down the door uh, to drag them out to not listen to their stories uh, to arrest them uh, if they're not good victims enough uh, and really there is no settlement processes there's no residency at the end of the trafficking process so really actually at the end of the day what we're seeing is that migrant women uh, get caught up in these raid processes uh, and actually what happens is they get deported uh, and that's been happening for the last 10 years uh, in, in more and more ways um, across the industry and so the question is not uh, whether or not trafficking exists. Of course trafficking exists. It exists in the sex industry, also exists in agriculture, exists in domestic service. Uh, it exists, bonded labour and forced labour is occurs when workers don't have enough power to um, resist the kind of processes that mean that you end up in really shit labour conditions. Uh, but amazingly, we have a huge amount of laws uh, that already exist in relationship to things like bonded labour and, and forced labour. Uh, this new addition of uh, anti-trafficking kind of hysteria uh, really just applies to migrant women. Uh, men are never really considered to be trafficked. And that really tells you something about the, the discourse around trafficking. Men uh, get people smuggled because they, they get to be, uh, have agency through their migration processes, but women don't. Women have to be duped. They have to, we have to be told a narrative that women in fact thought they were coming to Brighton to sell ice cream, but then amazingly what happened is they ended up in a brothel, right? So that kind of uh, making childlike uh, women uh, is a really old trick. Uh, and it's one that we need to call out and just call basically as the racist bullshit that it is. So um, I think a lot of the reason that migrants are involved in sex work is because sex workers and business is marginalised people. People who are sex workers are overwhelmingly people who have not been able to succeed in the capitalist system that we live in for many reasons. Migration status, disability, um, gender... Um, in the sense that whether or not they are transgender or LGBTIQA plus people, um, the work that we have under capitalism is a hostile place for anyone who does not really easily conform. So I think a lot of the people who end up um, in sex work choose to, choose to join the industry because it's a place where their identities can't be used against them in the same way that big business can use identities against people also think that people end up in the sex industry because it actually pays better than the vast majority of women's work. It's kind of about money, stupid, is what I would say to uh, <laughs> Theresa May. Uh, so if you don't want women to work in the sex industry, you need to pay other women more money. Uh, and that enables other work uh, to actually become a viable solution uh, because the minimum wage in this country is a poverty wage. Yeah. Uh, it actually means that you can claim benefits. That's how low it is. Uh, and so... Uh, this, these questions around the sex industry are not removed. They're not. They're central to women's work. They're central to women's experiences. Uh, and so, we can't allow the sex industry to be packaged off as some kind of deviant um, problem child over here that feminism gets kind of wring its hands about and doesn't really know what to do and makes everyone feel a bit icky. Um, but instead, actually, we need to bring sex workers and the question around the work of sex to the centre of feminism mm. and then actually see a whole variety of other questions that open up. And, you know, some of those, those contradictions are not easy, right? Like, no one's here to cheerlead the sex industry. Sex industry needs to be massively transformed. The only people that can do that are the workers within it, not the men in Westminster who are our clients, uh, not uh, the police who are in collusion with bosses. Uh, so like in terms of it's it's a it's an age old thing. The people who know best how to create that change are those who actually experience it. Yeah, I would really love to see the stats on like what sectors get hit the hardest by sex work strikes. Like because I can imagine that it's like Whitehall and like city the city and stuff. Um, but yeah, I mean, and I think it's just sort of 
it's so um because obviously like sex work strikes have existed for a really long time as well um but it's still something that kind of hasn't and even in quest conversations around intersectionality and and opening and kind of opening up like and forcing open the gates of feminism i still am not seeing sex work spoken about enough do you do you have any idea why that might be or do you think that's just me not really looking in the right place essentially I think the whole idea of sex work and its involvement in feminism opens up a lot of questions that people don't want to address. Mm. Um, and the the whole discourse that um, second and third wave feminism was built around um, does not allow for women particularly to be seen in disrespectful ways. So um, there, there is this kind of idea around sex um, that it's shameful and because women have been seen as things to provide sex, that we should be moving away from that in order to gain any kind of traction in a feminist movement. And a lot of the things that feminists are saying about sex work is, is that they're betraying the movement or they're even betraying their own genders um, just by doing what they need to to get by in our capitalist society. Um, and I think, it, again, it all comes down to respectability and it comes down to saying that sex work doesn't need to be palatable to people for it to exist and for the people within it to be safer. Um, and I think lots of feminists just don't want to accept that sex workers are here and that it's it's not something that can just be deleted from society. Also, the sex work strike isn't just for sex workers. Uh, so on at 7 p.m. on uh, International Women's Day, uh, you, People haven't really had an opportunity to come out in support of decriminalisation. This is your opportunity to come out in support of decrim uh, and to start having a think about the, your own conditions of sex in your own life and the, all of the different ways that actually sex is commodified, even if you don't consider yourself a prostitute. That's a really good note to end it on, actually. Um, so thank you so much to all of our guests for making this like one of the most memorable fixed shows that I've ever like that I can think of. Um, this is the end of our season um, at The Fix now, um, so we're going on a little break. But don't worry, there will be plenty of online um, content for you thirsty cyborgs out there. Um, we still have all of our regular podcasts, so Navara FM, All the Best, The Lockdown. Um, Tisky Sour will also be filming from this very studio every week. Uh, we also have some hot video content coming out and our articles, which you can find on the website. So there's plenty there to fill the fix-shaped hole in your life. Um, but in the meantime, it goes without saying that I will see you all on the streets this Thursday. Ciao for now. For every woman who is sick to death of being sexually harassed and bullied at work. For every woman going hungry and unable to heat their house. For every woman who expects to earn less than her male colleague, then come home and start a second shift of cooking, cleaning and caring. For every woman of transgender experience, who is subject to violence and whose womanhood is denied by the state, her doctor, her employers and those around her. For every woman who works to keep the national health and education systems functioning and has not received a pay rise in years. For every woman that has faced violence at the hands of partners, friends, colleagues or bosses and is not believed. For every woman who is kept powerless by a horse stigma for every woman suffering benefit cuts and poverty wages. For every woman who is told she's just going through a phase and has endured homophobia, biphobia or queerphobia at home, at work or in the street. For every woman who faces violence from the state through mass incarceration, immigration raids and racist policing. On the 8th of March 2018, women across the world are going on strike. This is a call to action for women in the UK to join the strike. We will refuse to work. We will be on the streets. We will shut things down and disrupt business as usual. We strike. We strike. We strike. We strike. We strike.